right. Um, cool. Hey, uh, welcome. Welcome to class, everyone. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I am. I'm doing. I'm doing pretty well myself. I'm, I'm reading through uh, all of your your first projects. I'm actually. I'm very close to done. I've got like three left. Um, but I, I'm gonna wait until you know I finish them all, and then I'll post the grids after that. But but uh, so I think you're. Everyone's doing quite well. All right. Um, and uh, I mean, everyone has already done quite well on the uh, on the projects. And I'm really enjoying reading through those. Um, it's yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty interesting to 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 get a good um, sample of countries and, and read through all of them. Uh, and I think you know, you guys have you know the sort of that that act of that weaving together uh, this historical narrative with with some of the analytic frameworks that we've uh been doing is, is is quite interesting okay so and learning learning some you know interesting little tidbits about the various countries or you know sort of institutions that existed laws and policies and events um is also it's quite quite nice for me okay so i think um yeah i mean uh for the it i uh in terms of the and this might be helpful for doing the, the next project um, in the current project, really. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm totally fine if you if, if you guys are citing encyclopedias, although I would think that, you know, and, and I think so like Britannica is out there. That's popular. Um, it's OK. If you want to cite Wikipedia, you can cite Wikipedia. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat of a Wikipedia enthusiast myself. Um, and uh, I think it's it's quite good. Um, I know there's a little bit of a sort of norm uh, against it. Um, I would assume that even in cases where people are prohibited from citing Wikipedia, uh, that they are actually reading Wikipedia and then just going to the sources contained therein, which is what I would do, I guess. Um, so so in the end, you know, these bans may be ineffective anyway, right? So, but but. Um, so, so yeah, you know, it's up to you. If you want to do Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica, if you want to say that, it's fine. If you want to say Wikipedia, I think that's even better. Um, and, you know, uh, maybe perhaps in other, in, in other fields, they, they, they may look down upon that, but I think that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm totally cool with it. Uh, and it's actually interesting because there was a, you know, people study Wikipedia. I study Wikipedia actually myself. Um, and, uh, you know, and it kind of, it relates to what we're talking about in this course quite a bit, because especially recently, you know, thinking about knowledge and the accumulation of knowledge and knowledge diffusion and stuff like that, Wikipedia and the internet in general, but especially Wikipedia has been like a huge part of that story, right. Um, you know, uh, of, of knowledge diffusion, right. So it's, it's quite intricately related to the, the kind of things that we're talking about here. Okay. It's more on like the open side. So it's not like, you know, it's not like a patent or a copyright where you have these policies that restrict what you can do with things. It's really about thinking about technologies that actually enhance what you can do with things. Um, so, you know, Wikipedia kind of open knowledge, uh, open source uh, code, you know, things like that um, is all, is all sort of on that, that open knowledge side. Okay. So, but, but, you know, people that did thinking, looking at Wikipedia, um, is particularly interesting because uh, there's the question of sort of how accurate is it, you know, um, and uh, because it's, you know, the uh, let me just open the chat here so I don't miss any comments from you guys. Um, yeah, so so it's interesting to think about how accurate it is because you know that uh, it can be edited by anyone, right? So of course you may be worried about accuracy, um, but that can kind of cut both ways, right? So anyone can edit it, meaning, you know, a malicious actor could insert misinformation in there or a sloppy actor could could insert, insert well, I guess the sloppy actor would insert misinformation. The malicious actor would insert disinformation, like actively trying to mislead people, right? So um, you might be worried about that, but at the same time, there's constantly tons of people looking at it and verifying it potentially and and anyone any one of those people can 
correct it if they want, if they feel that's necessary. Okay. Um, and that's as opposed to something more centralized and controlled like like Britannica, where it's just they get experts to to write this stuff and, and that's it, right? So you get you get like your choices, like you get one or like a small number of experts that are chosen somehow, uh, or you get like a billion armchair enthusiasts, right? And so the question is which one is better, right? Um and but so so for the case of sort of um encyclopedias you know they 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 looked at they sort of they did this little study where they uh chose some random topics uh and looked at like encyclopedia britannica and then looked at wikipedia and they had like other people come in and and, and see like how many errors were there just like factual or conceptual errors uh in the articles and they and they found that there was probably on par and, and even wikipedia maybe it was a, a little bit better right so so you so um it seems like with Wikipedia, at least for sort of certain topics that they looked at, like historical topics, um, you can achieve a similar level of accuracy, right? And at the same time, with Wikipedia, I mean, you, the Wikipedia is just just orders of magnitude larger than anything else, right? Than like, for instance, Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm, I'm picking on Britannica only because uh, there are studies on that, right? So this is probably true for other stuff like Scholarpedia and stuff like that. So. Um, but yeah, so so, it, you know, Wikipedia just has like tons more information, right? Not just about about like historical stuff or scientific things, uh, or like Pokemon or whatever, you know. So like, there's obviously a wide, a much wider variety of different topics. But but even within sort of like you know, classical, like you know, like serious topics or whatever you want to call it, um, the, the there's much more depth to uh, the coverage, right? So, um, I think it's interesting, um, and I and I you know so I'm. I, I I do some stuff with Wikipedia myself uh, in my in my own research, right? So um, I'm going to tell you about it because I think it's cool and I think you might be interested in it. Um, and you know, so one thing we we look at is uh, uh, you know what's what's the what's the influence of Wikipedia on the world, but specifically what we're interested in what's the influence of Wikipedia on sort of the progress of of science, okay? So uh, or like academic research in general, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, because, you know, it, it's, it's plausible to think that, uh, you know, the internet of course would, uh, influence the progress of, of research and of science, um, in the sense that it facilitates communication. So like email, like, which came around in really properly around in the, the mid eighties, I guess, um, really kind of changed things a lot because people more, you know, people could communicate effortlessly uh without having to mail, mail each other letters or call call each other up right um and so so communication becomes much more low cost um and and so you can talk to more people and so obviously you'd, you'd think there's some effect from that um and then when you have the internet coming around then it's sort of like you can codify this information and and and, and uh you know share it with other people in like a structured way okay so i mean of course you could share it with other people by writing a book or writing them specific letters, but with the internet, you can do so much more easily and, uh, uh, and, and send it out to whoever wants to see it. Right. So, um, it's, it's just that the costs go down basically the nature maybe, maybe doesn't change so much, but the costs go down a lot. Okay. And then once you then add on Wikipedia to that, I mean, what's, what's the, what's the value added of Wikipedia? Well, you know, the internet, it, it, like, uh, you know, the, the, the original sort of dream was similar in some ways to Wikipedia, right? So if you think, if you look at like, um, uh, HTML, right? HTML stands for like hypertext markup language. Uh, so hypertext is really just like the concept of having a bunch of documents that are linked together with, you know, like the little blue links underlying, uh, stuff. Right. So, so that's, that's the, the original dream was, was sort of hypertext is you have this, this interconnected system of pages and you can just jump around and, and find out whatever you want. Right. So, um, that's obviously changed a lot over the years, you know, because things become more, much more like functional because most web pages are much more than just like simple texts that are linked together. Right. Um, but then Wikipedia kind of brings you back to that foundation, which is just sort of like hypertext linking together documents and information, text and, and, and pictures. Um, but it adds on top of that, this new innovation, I would say, which is that, you know, sort of almost literally anyone 
can edit it. Right? I mean, they, they sometimes ban IPs if they if they're misbehaving, but almost anyone can edit it, right? If if they uh, as long as they can speak the language that it is written in and they know something about it, right? So, um, so that's that's the real addition of Wikipedia is, is the is the uh, collective uh, nature of it and the, the open nature of it, really. Okay, so um, yeah, so so then the the question is, does that change things, right? Because now, um, and and I guess the other thing with Wikipedia is is it's sort of a it's a focal it's become kind of a focal point. Right, so maybe all this stuff was kind of out there, but it's like all dispersed amongst random web pages, right? But now it's like you know, if you if you want to know something about you know some random topic, I mean, you, you Google it, right? But like you, Wikipedia is often sort of the one of the best sources for for discovering that if it's a scientific topic, for instance, right? So um, yeah, so so you could say it's a focal point too, right? But but at the end of the day, that's you know, it's 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 this collaborative. Uh, uh, component that's that's also important, right? So, um, yeah, so we were kind of interested in what's the effects on on science, um, and so like, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, we I've talked about causality a lot in this course and the importance of causality. I'm sure your your other professors have, uh, especially on the micro side, probably um, gone on about that at some length, right? About um, really understanding you know things beyond just correlations and, and getting up their their causal structure because correlations can often um mislead you right so um that's kind of an issue here right because you know if, if you want to know uh what is the effect of wikipedia right uh on science um one thing you might do is say okay well look at look at when there are new articles wikipedia articles that are created right so wikipedia the articles don't, you know, it, it started off small with, with a small set of topics and over time people add articles, right? And it, it's relatively easy to add an article. You have to kind of propose it and then uh, and there's some discussion and then if it's considered sort of a new topic, then people will say, okay, let's let's do this, right? So um, after that, you, editing is much more frictionless, right? So um, yeah, so you could look at, okay, well, look at when there's a new article on Wikipedia and then look over on science and say, oh, hey, is there anything happening differentially in science? So like, you know, someone created a new article on a particular type of chemical reaction, and then all of a sudden people are writing about that chemical reaction. Okay. So that that would be like that would be like one approach, right? Which would be a sort of observational approach, right? Uh, where you're saying, okay, look, let's look out into the world and see what's happening, uh, and see if we can infer anything about the world from the from that. Okay, but it's it's very much correlational too, right? So, um, so you can do that, right? I mean, it, it's uh, the, well, there's a lot of Wikipedia articles and there's a lot of uh, scientific articles. So there's, um, yeah, I mean, there's like millions of Wikipedia articles uh, out there, and the and same for for scientific articles, right? So, but you can do that, um, and uh, you know, nowadays when you look at new articles that are created, it's it's sort of mostly for relatively obscure concepts because most of the major concepts like the concept of an acid or a base have already been you know they were created in a long time ago as an article right so um but but you can you can look at that and, and see what's happening right and and the issue that arises is is related to these uh you know kind of these cause these causal issues that that i've been talking about and then that were sort of came to the fore in uh my nation's fail right which is that if something becomes important, so think about like, you know, stuff that the new stuff that's happening in science, like, um, like mRNA, well, mRNA is new, but like, you know, research related to mRNA or like, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, you heard of CRISPR, this gene editing technology, uh, that's a relatively new and kind of exciting, uh, uh, technology that they're, they're talking about there. So if you think about these new things that come up, well, you know, there's going to be, it's, it, you know, the, the idea is, is found is, 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 is investigated at some point. And there's going to be a lot of scientific articles about that. And there's also potentially at some point, someone said, Oh, we should create a Wikipedia article on this. Right. So, um, but it, so, so, and, and essentially like if, if you look at, um, draw a picture here, right. So if you, if you look at over time, sort of just in the kind of abstract, you know, what's sort of the, the amount of activity, um, uh, happening. Okay. So maybe, you know, it starts at zero. Okay. 
some point things are this this thing is discovered. Let's say it's CRISPR. Okay. Uh and then you know, so like, oh, this is, you know, there's some interest. Um and then at some point the interest, you know, grows and then, you know, whatever, it becomes very popular. Okay. And at some point in this progression, maybe here, someone says, Oh, let's let's create a Wikipedia article. Let's call it T Wikipedia. Okay. TW. Uh says, let's create a Wikipedia article, right? Um, and it's sort of at that inflection point, you know? So this is, I mean, I should label my axes. Time, not, I won't, years, maybe, maybe this is over the months or years, uh, time scale. Uh, and then this is like sort of um, activity. So uh, like number of articles maybe in like scientific journals or something like that, right? Um, so so you know, activity is going up and then maybe there's an inflection point where, the, where things really take off. Okay, and I guess it, I really should draw a graph that turns over backwards because that's impossible. You know, maybe maybe it levels off at some point, right? So, um, and you can look at this and say, "Oh, wow! Look at the effect of that Wikipedia article, right?" But it's not clear that that was actually the causal relationship, right? I mean, this people were were talking about this; they were communicating through other means. Um, they were excited about it, and and this is what typically adoption curves look like. This they they start out kind of slowly. Then they take off, but at some point you know, they kind of level off, right? Um, so maybe this would have happened without Wikipedia. Wikipedia was just kind of there, and when it started becoming popular, someone said, "Let's let's make this Wikipedia article, right?" And if you think about the alternative world where no Wikipedia article is created, well, may maybe it would look like really similar. Maybe it would just look like you know, like this, like a little bit lower, right? Because there were some people who who actually did find out the Wikipedia article, right? So, so getting the causal relationship. Saying attributing all that change to Wikipedia, that rise to Wikipedia, is it's not correct because it doesn't really get at the causal effect. It's just a correlation, right? Um, okay, so that that okay, so so the sort of we you know the question is what's the effect of Wikipedia on science? The the sort of semi naive approach of just looking out into the world and trying to figure it out probably doesn't work for these reasons. Okay, um, and. Uh, yeah, and so you need to be you need more a little bit more clever, right? So, um, but but essentially the the issue is um, the issue is that you know there's sort of there's research going on, right? And that that research can cause you know uh, scientific articles to be published, okay, over time, okay. Uh, it can also cause a Wikipedia article. To be published, or I guess like an entry, Wikipedia entry, okay, um, and then maybe the science also causes Wikipedia. So this this would be like the causal graph that we're looking at, okay. And so, um, in, in this case, right, if, if you think back to those those sort of abstract diagrams that we drew before about having different policies and how that influences countries and 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 their growth, for instance, okay. So here, you know, we're we're kind of interested in this thing here, this arrow, uh, science to Wikipedia. And, and we're also, well, actually, there's another arrow, which is, we're, we're interested in, sorry, I misspoke. We're interested in this arrow, Wikipedia is science, okay? But in fact, this is a very complex system because there's a third thing, which is sort of the underlying research, which is causing scientific articles and potentially Wikipedia. And scientific articles are potentially influencing Wikipedia because that's where they get the information. And potentially, you know, the thing we're interested in is that there's also this feedback, okay? But just looking at a correlation, between these two things isn't going to tell you about this arrow. It's going to tell you about all these different arrows and, and some some of them, some some kind of aggregation of all the different paths. Okay, so uh, it's really you know you can't just take the simple approach. Okay, so so what we do then is is exactly what what I talked about before is you do a you do an experiment, right? So you actually kind of um, I guess I guess in this case you know you think about you have an experimenter. Okay, that's me and my co-author Neil. We create Wikipedia articles. Actually, we didn't create them. We got people to create them, but you know, we kind of instigated it um, on particular topics. And then you look at the effect on on scientific articles. Okay, um, and so you, we create Wikipedia articles on uh, you know particular some really it has to be something obscure because it's stuff that doesn't exist on Wikipedia yet. So it's like some random chemical reaction or something like that. Um, 
And uh, so you, we got people to write those, like, you know, like PhD students in, in chemistry to, to write these. And then we get them published on Wikipedia. And then we see, like, what happens um, in science. Okay. Um, and that's that's pretty that's a pretty good approach. Right? That that's that mimics what I was what I talked about when I drew these graphs before. It's you do the experiment, okay? You you induce variation in your x variable, your the variable that you think is causing stuff, okay? And then you see what happens in your y variable, the very like the outcome variable that you're interested in. That's that's the notion of an experiment, okay? Um, there's one more wrinkle on top of this, which, though, which is like. Um, Suppose you publish a bunch of articles, right, in Wikipedia, and then you look at are there scientific articles also on those topics? Okay, um, you need you need a control. Okay, so we know you know if, if we didn't already know, we we I think more people know at least you know this concept of a, con a controlled a randomized controlled trial from the vaccine stuff. Okay, um, for COVID, uh, you know the, this concept that you need sort of a baseline. Right. So if you did it and you said, oh, well, you know, I did, I, I made these Wikipedia articles and then there are a bunch of publications in those same fields in, in that about that particular chemical reaction. So therefore the Wikipedia article caused that. Right. But it might have been that there's just randomly like it might be just people just are publishing on everything that whatever you created your Wikipedia article about people would have published in that because they're always looking around for new stuff to, to think about, to, to research and to publish on. Okay, so you need a baseline basically. So, um, so on top of that, what we did was we we actually had people bunch of, write a bunch of Wikipedia entries, and then we just chose half of them randomly to publish, and then we took the other half and put them in our virtual file drawer, which is to say we didn't publish them, right? So there, then you get this baseline where you can say, okay, well, here's some topics that we could have written on, but we didn't on Wikipedia, and then we can compare what happens in the science with those to what happens in the ones that we actually did write about and publish in Wikipedia. Okay. And there, then you can really see. So that's, you, you have your treatment and your control. You run the experiment, you know, you, you do the treatment. Okay. Which is in this case, publishing Wikipedia articles and you have a control set that you can compare against and you just don't publish those. Okay. And then you look at these outcomes. Okay. Um, you know, and maybe, uh, you know, you know, in that case, then, then you could, you could have an analogous graph. Okay. And you could say, go oh, over time, you know, people are publishing in this stuff and maybe this is what the control looks like. Okay. And this is where, well, I guess I should have these line up because why not? Okay. And say, but let's say this is where you publish the Wikipedia article. Okay. And this time we're publishing it. It's not just some, some rando. Um, and then you, you look at the treatment side, then maybe it looks like this. Okay. So this Wikipedia is not going to single-handedly, you know, revolutionize a the field. The, these effects are not going to be, you know, um, changing things by orders of magnitudes, but you might expect some effect, right? So, so here you can see, you know, kind of on average in this particular outcome that I just sort of invented, uh, you know, publishing that Wikipedia article sort of changed the slope, right? So we would have kind of just went along as normal, but here, you know, you changed the slope. Okay. So that, that's an example of, a, of an RCT. In this case, it's, it's on, on Wikipedia on a topic that's relevant to us thinking about knowledge goods and things like that um, and knowledge diffusion in general. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, you know, um, that's something, you know, this, this RCT approach, RCT, RCT. So that's a, uh, you know, randomized control, controlled, I actually don't know, trial. Okay. So, and then, so that's, that's an RCT. Um, so basically, uh, that's an example of, of an RCT. Okay. Um, now this, and so that this same approach, you know, this is taken, this comes really from a lot of it, you know, the, 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 the core idea, you know, is, is, was originally used in thinking about, um, you know, pharmaceuticals and things like that, right? So with COVID, you know, they, they have this uh, vaccine and, you know, some people get the, vac the real vaccine and some people get the placebo, but they don't know which one they got, right? And it's important that they don't know which one they got in this case, because if you know you got the vaccine, um, and you guys can all get, you guys are all eligible now for the vaccine because everyone over or sixteen is eligible. If you know you can get the vaccine, uh, you may act differently, right? Uh, if you know you've been vaccinated, sorry, you may act differently. You may say, "Oh, well, I'm vaccinated now. I'm going to go out and do whatever I want." Okay, um, and and that would be problematic because 
if you then looked at uh, the if you if you compared let's see if you compared people who who got the vaccine and knew it to people who didn't get the vaccine and also knew it okay uh, well there there'd be some effect which is your the vaccine works right uh, hopefully and and in this case you know it does so there'd be some effect right but then that's going to be partially counteracted potentially if you go out and and are a little bit um, less careful about you know wearing a mask or whatever. Okay, which which would then mean you would underestimate the effect of the vaccine. It would look less effective than it actually is, right? So that's why you don't tell people, because then you 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 um you kind of poison the well, you muddy the waters. Okay, uh, all right. Um, it's kind of the same thing here. You know, you, we don't publish the the control Wikipedia articles because we want to use them as a baseline. If we publish them, well then there there be no treatment control dichotomy. Okay, um, so that's. That's where that's where it comes from, and that's how it's being used, uh, sort of analogously in in today with the COVID vaccines. This is an example that I happen to do, to to do, um, and uh, but but you know in in econ it's it's also uh, common. You know, so you see it a lot in development, right? So they'll come up with a particular policy, like giving people a hundred bucks or something, um, and then they'll see what you know. Uh, what's it? So in, the, in that in that case, um, you you know. If you got the hundred bucks, it's not like you, they give you like monopoly money or something. So you, you kind of know that you got the hundred bucks, right? But but what you do is you, you you say you only give it to certain people and you randomly choose those people, okay? Or you only give it to certain cities, uh, people in a certain village or a city or something like that. And then you compare the cities that got the treatment versus those that didn't, uh, or the villages that got the treatment versus those that didn't, okay? So, so you still randomize, okay? And of course, people kind of know whether they're treatment or control because it's hard to not know if you get a hundred bucks. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you're not, you're not saying, oh, you know, if you want a hundred bucks, come on by this building and we'll give it to you and see what happens. And then you compare people who, who took the, who came and got the hundred bucks versus those that didn't, because the people that come, they may be a selected sample. Maybe they have more time on their hands because they're retired and, you know, retired people spend and act differently from non-retired people, um, and things like that. So, so you, you, you know, you don't want to just. You, you, you got to be careful about how you do this stuff, and, and the way to be careful generally is to to randomize things. Okay. Um, all right. So that was a lengthy aside, but it, it's something I kind of wanted to talk about at some point, and I couldn't really figure out a good place or time to do it. And well, this is the second last class, so I figured I should probably do it eventually. Um, uh, yeah. So that was a random aside, but it does kind of tie back into to these questions of, of idea and, and knowledge and knowledge diffusion. Okay. So. Um, yeah. Uh, and now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to switch back to what we were talking about before. Okay. Um, and in particular, we're going to we're going to jump back into the room rattle. Okay. And really finally finish off what I feel like we've been doing for for a while. This is taking longer than than I kind of wanted, but sort of unavoidable. Okay. But actually, we're going to solve the room rattle today. Finally. All right. We're going to solve the Romer model. We're going to get an actual outcome that we can think about and reason about and evaluate the reasonableness of. Okay. And then, uh, well, then probably we'll be out of time. All right. So um, let's do it. Okay. So so we have a lot of stuff that we've already done. Okay. So this is Romer model. The Romer model. I, my handwriting is now completely gone um this Roma model okay so we're gonna we're gonna think about this all right and just to give you kind of the high level overview remember okay you know it's it's kind of like solo you know we still have capital and labor okay um except what we do is all this capital kind of gets uh split up okay and used in different intermediate goods okay um, and then those all get sort of combined back together with labor, okay, into some, see their arrows here, right? Final output Y. Okay, so solo was just capital labor Y, okay, and I guess technology, okay? Now we have all these different goods, okay, there, there, there's A of these goods, okay, in here there's, you know, A different goods, okay? 
Um, and A is, so it's the number of goods, but it's also, we'll see a measure of technology. So with Solo, we had A, K, and L, technology, capital, and labor mapping just directly into Y. It was relatively simple. Okay. Now, A, we're, we're kind of endogenizing A. We're, we're, we're slightly changing the meaning of A. A is the number of intermediate goods. We're taking capital, saying, okay, you get some machines, you get some machines or, or buildings or whatever, um, or equipment. Okay. Um, and then you, you, you produce things, these X, I's, and then we combine all those back together with labor, with some kind of Walmart, Amazon, you know, store, uh, and we get final output. Okay. So it, it's reminiscent of solo, but we're kind of, we're moving A around or changing the interpretation of A. Okay. Um, but the cool thing is that you actually get back exactly what we started with before, kind of because we set things up carefully, we get back exactly what we started with before. Okay. And remember this, the, you know, that's the, the picture format. Okay. Um, you know, if, if, if we write about, write it out algebraically, what it looks like is this. So we have L to, to the one minus alpha, just like before, and that was integral of zero to a, of uh, uh, X I to the alpha B I. Okay. So the, you know, the X I's, they all, they get raised to the alpha, just like with, with capital before. All right. But we're splitting them up and then integrating over them. Okay. Um, and so the, the, this first equation here kind of tells you what the production function looks like. The other thing that kind of you need is, is you, you kind of just as an accounting fact, I mean, you need to, to express this idea that we're splitting up capital into X i. And the way you would do that here is say, well, the sum of all the X i's, this is, this is an X here. The sum of all these X i's is capital, right? We, we, we split up the capital. Therefore, just as a, a matter of counting things up, this should be true. Okay, so we take capital, split it up into these XIs, and then we route it to this production function, and that's that's what we got. All right, so so this is really we're taking solo and kind of adding this new dimension of intermediate products of, of the ver different varieties of products. Okay, and in some sense, that's the beauty of Romer is that it, it starts with solo reinterprets a and then you kind of get back solo but you get back more than just solo okay you get back you get back stuff about, about innovation and how much research people are doing and, and things like that okay um okay so so and and uh so what did we find okay so what we did was we said okay well think about this amazon store okay amazon company and think about okay they're they're buying all these they're buying these intermediates and basically the intermediate firms are saying, oh, here, here's my price, okay? And the Amazon says, okay, taking, taking that price is given, here's how much I'm gonna buy, okay? And that's um, that's that's that inverse demand function, okay? Uh, I'll make sure I get this right. So, so that's that inverse demand function. So this is like production function stuff, production system or something like that. Okay, that inverse demand that we found, okay, I'm not gonna go over the derivation again, but what we found was that it looked like this. Okay, it was, it looked like an inverse demand function because, um, you know, the more you wanna sell, the less price you're gonna be able to charge, right? Um, or if you invert this function into a demand function, the higher the price you charge, the less you're gonna be able to sell. Okay, so this is sort of standard, all right? Um, and then uh, we had that intermediate firm. Was saying, okay, well, okay, given that inverse demand function, I'm going to sort of choose how much to produce. If I choose XI, then I'll know from the inverse demand how much I can charge. And then I can look at my costs, you know, which are just um, R, basically it's a, a marginal cost of R. Uh, and given that I'm going to choose my, my quantity or my price optimally. And it turns out that what you get is you're going to choose a price, which is your marginal cost R divided by alpha. So, so you're, you're going to choose, basically you're going to mark up your price. Your, uh, your markup over marginal cost is one over alpha. So if alpha is a half, you're going to charge two X of your marginal cost and pocket the rest as profits. Okay. Which you're allowed to do. That's all you're allowed to make profits. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so in, in our world, maybe we think about alpha as being a third. That's pretty standard. Okay, you guys, you know, we saw that in the, we saw it solo. We saw, you guys all saw that in your mini projects. And number one, doing that growth analysis. Um, 
for a lot of countries off, it's about a third. So here you'd get, um, you know, you'd actually charge three times your marginal cost, okay? Because you're somewhat of a monopolist, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't know, it seems, it actually seems kind of high, but, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the firms are doing research at the, at the outset, right? They're doing research and then they become a monopolist, okay? So, you know, they, they you kind of want to be able to compensate them for that initial research cost up front, okay? So, so that's what we get. We get that um, they charge a, a, this price PI. So what's interesting is that this is the same for every firm, right? So the PI equals something R over alpha that's not a function of I. So every firm charges that same price R over alpha, okay? Which means that, um, you know, all these XIs, well, you can you can solve for what exactly that's going to be, but they're going to they're going to be sort of constant uh, over i. So they're, they're not, xi is not going to depend on i either, right? Because if p is the same from that inverse inverse demand function, then xi is going to be the same too. Okay. Um. All right, and so then what what does that tell us? Well, here if if, if you make this assumption that xi is, is constant and let's say it's just equal to some value x, okay? Then what does that imply? Well, on the bottom, that would imply that k is equal to a times x, right? So if that xi is constant, when you integrate from zero to a, you just get ax, okay? And now remember, we're not integrating over x here. You know, usually if you integrate x, you think it's, oh, it's one half x squared. Right, that's calc. That's true. I'm not contesting that. That's always been true. It was true even before Newton, in some sense, discovered it. You could say, um, but uh, we're not integrating over x. We're integrating over i. Okay, so we we have all these products, and they each have some value for x. If x is constant, then we're just integrating over a constant, which is basically a rectangle. Okay, at that point, so it's just the width times the height. The width is a. The height is x. Okay, so you get k equals a x. All right. Which also mean, which means if you inverted that, that x must be k over a, right? So if all the x's are the same, and we're we're getting these x's from some group pile of capital K, then each individual x, and there's a x's, then each individual individual x must be getting k over a, right? That's just this is logic, all right? That's accounting. Um, okay, and so and then once you do that, if you plug that back into this production function up top. Okay, so for that xi, you put in k over a, then you do the integral, okay, then you get back exactly the classic Cobb-Douglas solo style. If you work out the algebra, we did it last time, you get that solo style thing back. Okay, so that's the sense in which, okay, we took, we started with solo, we added an element, then we kind of solve things, and it turns out we get solo back, but we're going to get more than solo back. We're going to get other stuff, okay? But this will make our lives easier. All right, so <clears throat> that's great. All right, so so that's that's where we're at. Okay, now this, this you know all the stuff we basically we've done over the past two classes. All right, so this is just sort of uh, reviewing that. Okay, um, so what else can we say? All right, well it turns out if we think about this intermediate firm. Well, we're we're gonna be interested in what their profit is, okay? Because the 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 game here is we find the intermediate firm's profit level. So you go with this. If you if you come up with a new product type, you can become a monopolist and make some profit pi i. So the profit's gonna be pi i, basically forever, okay? And so that's your that's the benefit of doing innovation. There's gonna be some cost, which is gonna be like the wage, and what we're gonna do is balance those out. And that's going to be our notion of equilibrium. Okay, but to do that, we need to know what the profits are. Okay, so profit is what? So it's going to be revenue, PI times XI minus cost, which in this case, your marginal cost R times XI. Okay, and if you factor that XI out, well, you just get this PI, which is PI minus R, your price margin times your quantity. Okay, so your, your profit is your price margin times your quantity. Um, and we actually know what those things are now. Okay. So that's good. 
So we know that PI is uh, R over alpha. We solved that. Well, we know R is R. We're going to leave that as is. And then we now know that XI is equal to some common X, which we just found to be K over A. K over A. All right. OK. That's good. Um, and then uh, so we can we can work with this a little bit. So this is going to be, well, you can factor out that R. Right, so you're going to get you know one over alpha minus one times R K over A. All right. Um, and then we can well we can do a little bit more. We can say okay, you can you can combine these fractions. So one one over alpha minus one. Turn that one into an alpha over alpha. You're going to get one minus alpha over alpha times R K. So that's good. It's better. All right. It's a step. All right. We still don't really know what RK is. All right. And A is just kind of out there. All right. So, R, well, what is RK? RK is, that's, you know, so you have this capital and you need to, to, to rent it, you pay a price R. So RK is the total amount of money going to renting capital at a given time. All right. Um, and A is the number of products. Okay, so we can actually find, uh, we can find RK. Okay, and so if you go back up here, this this inverse demand function, so this PI is equal to alpha L over XI. We know what L XI is now, okay, so we can exploit that. So it's equal to alpha, it's gonna be XI is K over A, so this is gonna give you AL over k to the one minus alpha. Okay. And uh, so so that's what we can do is just look at you know the inverse demand that tells us that um, pi is equal in the end to alpha over alpha times a over k to the one minus alpha. And we also know that pi is equal to r over alpha. Okay. So combining those two, these things pi is equal to this, but it's also equal to this, all right, can give us, what I'm going to label this as the capital share, and we'll see, you know, sort of capital share of income, all right, we'll see how that works. Okay, so we have that, you know, r over alpha is equal to pi, which is also equal to alpha al over k. All right, now, that term on the right, we've kind of seen stuff like that before. That looks like kind of a marginal product of capital. Um, and actually, if you think about it, that what is that? That's the term on the right is alpha times al to the alpha. Okay, so it's alpha times al to the alpha times k to the alpha minus one which is actually just alpha times y over k. Right, so if you look up over here, you got al to the one minus alpha. And if you divide by k, you get k to the alpha minus one, which is exactly what we have here. And then you throw on another alpha just for fun. Okay, and so that's what you get. Okay, so the, the trick here is that you can use that production function of what we know about x to get this. And then from here, we can solve for that rk term that we were interested in. So rk is alpha squared why? Okay. And that's going to be useful over on the right. Okay. But what, it, but what is this? I, I call that the capital share and it is indeed the capital share. Okay. It's saying you know, RK is the total amount of money going to, to rent capital. These, these intermediates are renting capital. They're buying, they're renting a building or a, a machine and they're producing. Okay. So they're, they're paying money to do that. And so that's R times K. Okay. And that's going to be some alpha squared fraction of total output. Okay, so this is part of your, uh, what we can construct to be a GDP equation, okay? So if alpha is a third, as we often take it to be, then this is going to be a ninth. So, you know, a little less than 10% of income is going to capital. It's not that much, but, you know, it'll do, all right? Um, okay, and then we're going to use that for our profit equation, 
Okay, so then when we do that, so we're going to get what? Uh, 1 minus alpha over alpha. So now RK is now alpha squared over times Y. And then uh, that, so, so the RK is alpha squared times Y, and then we still have that divided by A. Okay. So alphas are going to kind of cancel, sort of. So we'll get alpha times 1 minus alpha times Y over A. Okay, so that's better, right? So pi i, the total amount of profit, the, the amount of profit for a specific intermediate firm is the alpha times one minus alpha times y over a. It's even better if you multiply by a. You multiply the a over, you get alpha pi i. So a times pi i is equal to alpha minus alpha times y. So this is basically the profit share. Okay, um, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at this pi i equation, at some point along the way, we discovered basically at this point, once we realize that the price and the quantity are, are set exactly the same for every i, that means that the profit must be exactly the same for every i. Okay, and so then the total amount of profit is just what each individual firm makes times the total number of firms, which is a, because each firm produces one product, okay? So there's A products, hence A firms. So the total amount of profits in the whole economy for these firms is A times pi. And here, this is saying that that's alpha times one minus alpha times y. So it's still some share, right? Alpha is less than one. So one minus alpha is less than one. Therefore, the product of them is also less. Okay. So, uh, in, you know, if, so, so here, so there's some weird noise. I don't know if that noise is, but it's happening. Um, okay, so the uh, I think it's construction. Um, so you know, over here we said this that you know RK is approximately. I'm gonna have to. I can't move far enough to get out of the way. So let's go over here. So it's approximately equal to uh, assuming alpha is a third. You know, let's you know let's say this is about ten percent of y. Okay. Very approximate. Um, and then over here, this profit share, well, if alpha is a third, then it's a third times two thirds, which is two ninths, which in my world, we're gonna say is 20%. Very approximate of the um, profit, okay? So, um, all right, and now <clears throat> when you combine these two, <clears throat> what do you get? So, so maybe we're interested in What's the total amount of money going to either capital or profit? Because, like, you know, uh, if you own a firm that owns a building and you rent out the building, okay, it's kind of like it's it's you're getting capital income, but then it's it's also profit. Okay, I mean you have to maintain the building, but like let's say it's mostly profit as the front at the firm level. So this stuff often it, it's sort of interchangeable depending on how you 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 who owns what and how you you think about the corporate structure. Um, in the end, it's sort of like the capitalists versus the workers, right? So um, so 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 in that case, you could say well what the the sum of these was well, alpha squared plus this term alpha times one minus alpha, but actually this is just alpha minus alpha squared. So if you add them together, you just get alpha. Right, so so what I'm saying is, you know, alpha squared plus alpha one minus alpha is equal to alpha. All right, and if you add these two together, indeed, you see, you see it's ten percent plus twenty percent, which is thirty percent, which is in my very approximate world approximately equal to a third. Okay, if you did if if if, if I if I said one ninth and two ninths, then you get three ninths, which is actually literally a third. So it's just these approximations adding up, but you can see that the the total amount of income going to either capital or profits, which is to say non-labor stuff, is alpha. Just like it was before. Remember before in, in solo world, the total amount of income going to capital was alpha as well. And then everything else went to labor. Here, again, everything else will go to labor. Okay, so you can see we, we kind of reconverge back to solo in the in once you kind of add these two together, but then we also have, we have this notion of, of there's capital income and there's, there's actual profits, okay? Um, Okay, so that's 
That's good. So so this the good thing here though is that we got profit. All right, we kind of basically know what profit is. Okay, it's some fraction of income. All right. Um and now we're we're almost in a position where we can uh think about what's the equilibrium. Okay. So, um This is what we had from the last page, okay? This this expression for profit, okay? Um, now, there's one one little wrinkle is that you know profit is like it's like what you're making this year. I I that's how much the intermediate and intermediate firm is making in a given year, okay? Um, we actually want to know what's the value. So instead of what is their income or their their profit or what do you, EBITDA or whatever you want to call it, um, we want to know what's their value, which is more like their stock price. Okay, so the, the stock price is the net present value of the future flow of firm profits in general. Okay, um, so we want to know that because that's that's really what you think about when you when you create a new product. This firm lasts forever, so you get the value, the present value. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, okay, so, you know, I, I, go, I go over this in the slides. It turns out anytime you want to turn a, a flow value, like a yearly flow value into a present value, in this world, you can just divide by the uh, discount rate, okay? So let's say, let's just say that rho is your discount rate, okay? And you, maybe it's like about equal to 5%, okay? So you discount the future, every year in the future, you discount by another 5%. Right. Um, so, so here, so I go through this in the slides and, you know, just cause we're a little short on time, I'm not going to go into great detail, but we're going to say that the, the value is going to be that profit divided by the discount rate. That, that's sort of like a general thing. It, it's related to these, this, when you, if you, you know, if you guys remember doing like this bond accounting stuff, like next year divided by one plus R plus two years from now divided by one plus R squared. It's like that, but in, in a more continuous time setting. Okay. So, uh, the, the, yeah, so the, we're, we divide by row. So, so if row is 5%, 0.05, then this means that the value is 20 times the yearly profits, okay? And if and you, you maybe you've heard the, the PE ratio, right, price to earnings ratio. Well, the left-hand side here is price. That's a stock price. The right-hand side, pi, at least, is earnings. So, so PE ratio in this world is, is V over pi, which is, as you can see, one over row. Okay, so in this world, P ratio is just 20, or it's one over row, which is going to be about 20. Okay, I forget what it is in the real world. It, it, it's actually, I think, often, I mean, it varies a lot over time and across stock, but 20 ain't so bad. Okay, um, Okay, so then um, I think they're probably actually closer to 10 in a lot of cases for various reasons. Okay, so, um, so this is what we have. All right, we're just going to run with it. Okay, and so then we get you know, alpha one minus alpha over rho times y over a. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. And so then, so that's your value. Okay. And now what we can do, all right, is, is we want to think about, okay, so we have some value associated with the successful innovation. Okay. We also... We need to think about costs, okay? And so essentially what you need to, to get a successful innovation, you need to pay a researcher to research things for you. And at some point they'll be successful with some probability. And so that's how you make this calculation. Okay, so if you, if, if, if so your, your, your benefit, so like your marginal benefit of, of hiring a researcher is, is the, well, it's gonna be the probability that that's a successful, which, which I'm gonna call it gamma, okay? Uh, times VI. Okay, so that's your marginal benefit, right? Um, and then your marginal cost is gonna it's gonna be the wage W. Okay, and actually, you know, it can, our equilibrium notion we will equate those. You will, you know, people will do hire more or less researchers until these two things are equal. In which case, they're happy at that point. Okay. Um, all right, so we, we know a lot about the marginal benefit. Okay, the marginal cost we know a little bit less about, but basically the, the wage 
in this world, it, it's it's going to be equal to the marginal product. So the derivative of y with respect to l is kind of what we often find. Okay, so and that's going to be one minus alpha times y over. L. Okay, so we we saw this in solo. It's the same thing as in solo, basically. It, it's relatively unchanged. Okay, so so that's going to be you know. Um, and, 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 you know, this makes a lot of sense because if, if you multiply that L over, you get W times L is equal to one minus alpha times Y, right? This is that last part of that GDP equation because before we said, okay, alpha squared is going to capital. Alpha times one minus alpha is going to profits. The sum of those two is just alpha is going to either capital or profits, kind of like capitalist stuff, okay? That then that all that left was one minus alpha, and where does that go? Well, that goes to labor. Okay, so now we have this breakdown into the now three components, not just two, uh, of alpha squared, alpha one minus alpha, and then one minus alpha, and those all sum to one, which is good because now we don't have any loose ends. All right, there's no income that's just kind of disappearing. It's all going somewhere, which is important. Okay. Um. All right, so that's that's our wage. Okay. Uh, yeah. So then at this point. We can we can talk about equilibrium, okay? Which is going to be sort of we're going to equate the marginal benefit and marginal cost of research, private marginal benefit and private marginal cost, okay? So so what does that mean? Well, that you know MB equals MC means you know gamma VI is equal to W, okay? Um, All right, and uh, well, we know we know all we know most of this stuff. Okay, so we're gonna get you know gamma alpha times one minus alpha over rho, and then y over a. On the left, that's marginal benefit. This is copying what we saw over on the, on the left side for vi. Okay. Um, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, on the right hand side, we're going to get, you know, one minus alpha times y uh, over L. Sorry, no, y over L. Okay. All right. So this is, we're, we're in the neighborhood of a, of a, an answer here. Okay. So one, one thing we do need though is um, we kind of want to get rid of A. Okay. Cause we, we, we don't really know what A is. Okay. The, the good thing though is if you look at this equation here, the y's cancel. Okay. And the one minus alphas also cancel. Okay. So we're going to get gamma alpha is left over over rho and then one over a. The left and on the right, we're just going to get one over l. Okay. So, so we're actually kind of close to an answer here. All right. Um, yeah, we're, we're quite close to an answer here, all right? Uh, the one last piece of the puzzle we need, okay? So remember I said that you hire a researcher and that researcher has some probability of being successful, which is gamma, okay? And um, that kind of implies this idea as production function. So like, what, what does ideas production looks like look like? Well. The, the rate of change of A then is just going to be gamma times the number of researchers. So each researcher has a probability of success gamma. If there's R researchers, then the total number of, of new ideas created at a, at a given time is gamma times R. And that's A dot. Okay, so A dot is gamma times R. Okay. Um, and that means, you know, if you think about the growth rate, which is going to be A dot over A, that's going to be gamma R over A, okay. Um, all right, and actually, what you can do is, well, remember when we did Jones before, we had that situation where you had to have, if, if, if the you know population is growing at rate N, then to sort of, to get a constant growth, growth rate, if you know if the number of researchers is growing at rate N, then A also has to be growing at rate N. Okay, to, to, so that you get this constant growth rate, right? So what this is going to imply is that G, you know, is equal to N 
is equal to gamma r over a. Okay, and from that we can solve for a. So a is going to be equal to gamma r over n. All right. So so from here, to move this up a little bit. From here, we find that a is going to be gamma over n. All right. So uh, you can see that. Yeah. So so that that gives us a basically. Okay. And then we can um, plug that in over here. Okay, I know I'm going a little quick here, but we're almost out of time. Uh, so you get the reverse of that n over gamma r. Okay, is equal to one over l. All right, and then finally, then you get alpha. Those gammas will cancel. You get alpha n over rho r is equal to one over l. Okay, and then the the final thing is that the uh you know the l is the number of production workers okay and so if you think you know the the, the if there's a total amount of workers okay then and they're either production workers or research workers then that should sum up to the the, the total population okay so if the total population is like p then that that l should just be p minus r so if you're not a researcher then you're a production worker you have to work sorry Okay, um, so then this is what you're going to get. Okay, um, and at this point you can you can solve this. Okay, uh, or you you can solve this equation. Okay, to get um, the fraction of people that are actually doing research. Okay, all right. And so in that case, you get you know s if you, if you define sr to be you know the total number of researchers over the population. Okay. You can solve this. I know I'm skipping like three different steps here, but we're almost out of time. You can solve that and, and arrive at this equation. Okay. So that's, you know, so you get the fraction of people that are doing research. Okay. Um, and, and that's really the, the, the new thing that we get, right? So we, we introduced all this crazy complexity only to arrive basically back at solo. But the new thing that we get is we actually get, okay, how much research is happening? Okay, and remember this this is driven by private incentives. This is driven by people thinking, I'm gonna do some research or hire a researcher, but that costs wage W. Um potentially come up with a new idea with probability gamma. Um and then get this this present value V, which is really it represents, you know, a, a, a you know eternal stream of profits pi I, okay, that I get from being a monopolist and selling the sort of differentiated good. Okay. So there, there's the, we, we, we micro founded the whole research pipeline. Okay. Which is a lot of work. Okay. But at the end of the day, we, we, we can really understand, okay, given this production system, here are the, the incentives for creating a new product and here's how they, how they all work out given the ideas production function, given the, the parameters like alpha production function itself, the growth rate and, um, and, uh, and everything like that. And then at the end of the day, we get this research share. Okay, and so so you know just quickly if if let's say that um, I guess yeah okay so let's say that uh, n is the growth rate it's also the population growth rate so let's say that's two percent I said before that rho maybe is, is about five percent okay and let's say that alpha is um, about a third which in my world is thirty five percent okay um, what do you get uh, what what do you get? Um, you, you're going to get so if you do that, you're going to get this is very practical. You're going to get SR about equal to ten percent. Okay, so ten percent of people are doing research. That's actually a little high. Okay, it, it really depends on how you define research. Okay, I know I'm over time here, but it depends how you define research because are you just are you literally a scientist? Do you include scientists, and engineers? Do you include People, writers, they're doing research, they're coming up with new books, uh, musicians, everything. You, you, depending on how broadly you define these notions of ideas and technology and all that, you could perhaps argue for 10%, right? So, um, yeah, but that's that's sort of the, the, the first prediction we get out of this.